Yes, you're more than welcome to join us in the Inner Sanctum anytime on The Breakfast Club, and I reckon you'll enjoy the next half an hour or so when Isaac Smith joins us from the Hawks. Good morning, Isaac. Morning, Arf. No golf for you today. You've got a very casual attire. No, you. mate. Just uh, a little bit of study, so some of us have to be professional in the AFL world. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you suggesting isn't? Oh, there's a lot of boys probably out on <laughs> the golf course right now. So. <laughs> Wednesday's day off normally? Yeah, Wednesday's a day off, and uh, I think hunting day would be getting a fair run right at the moment. Well, with weather like this, it'd be stupid not to if they've got access to it. Uh, well, it's been the wash-up from uh, Sunday's game because you're very good, the boys, on the weekend. After the first quarter when possibly a scare might have gone through the camp, uh, you ran over, steamrolled the days. Yeah, it was pretty pleasing in the end half, I guess. Uh, I was mentioning to you off air before that uh, the D's I think, kicked the first four or five goals of the game and uh, were pretty shell-shocked, but uh, we knuckled down and ended up getting a really good win, I think. The D's kicked one goal post about the 20-minute mark of the first quarter for the rest of the game. Correct, so that was yeah. pretty pleasing. It doesn't often happen, that, that sort of streak. When did you know that you had had the game toasted? Uh, I guess probably start of the last quarter. Uh, we were probably four or five goals up and it was a wet day, so it was pretty hard to kick goals in the mm. end. So um, we were pretty confident then. But, uh, yeah, it felt like we controlled the game uh, really well after half time. so that was really pleasing. Can I go back a week? to the game against Richmond. Both you and Geelong came off the Monday game to six-day breaks, and Richmond had the nine. How much uh, how much um, physical duress did the, the Monday game take out of you, and do you think that affected your performance against Richmond? Yeah, I'm not sure if it was a six-day break or uh, Richmond having the longer break, but I do know after we play those Easter Monday games, and it's probably a bit like when Collingwood played Queen's birthday or Anzac Day, the teams tend to have probably a little bit of a lull. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got to work on that and make sure we don't do that every year. But um, it was a pretty fierce competitive game against Geelong and uh, went down right to the final siren as well. That's no excuse, which are really good. But um, I think you probably see in professional sports teams that come off really big games uh, might dip a little bit after it. When you get into a situation like you're in last weekend after the first quarter, down by... Uh, a lot. What, what's the mindset? How do you go into that break or does it happen out on field before you go into the break where you're trying to kind of drag yourselves out of it? Yeah, I think, uh, Cheryl, what was really good was it was probably the 20-minute mark we turned it around. Um, if you're watching the game, you probably just think it's the first quarter um, and then we stopped and then we restarted and we got going. But it felt like we probably gained control uh, between the 20-minute mark and quarter time um, in that little patch. So... Uh, we just start to do the little things uh, really well again. Early on, uh, we missed a lot of tackles and uh, we were second to the ball, but we recognised that probably halfway through the first quarter and just tried to clean that type of stuff up. So when you say you recognise it, does everyone recognise it or is there the message come from the coach or is it just you guys out on field? How do you kind of go, you know, this is obviously not going well, these yeah. are the key things that we need to do better? Uh, well, I guess it all depends, and it all depends where the ball is. The forwards probably didn't recognise much because the ball hadn't been down there. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, the defenders um, would be yelling out stuff to us, but uh, a lot of it starts in the midfield. I think you have over 100 stoppages a game, Nelly. So, um, and we had the chance to have a few centre bounces uh, as Melbourne were kicking a few goals very quickly. So the midfield group got together and um, they were trying to nut it out. And then you also got the runner that comes on. Um, sporadically and we'll feed some information but yeah it was good on the weekend the players recognise it and we're able to change it I think it's interesting because we had Max Gorn in here yesterday Big Gorny Yeah and talking about how do, you, how do you solve their problem where they let in 10 goals in a row and they've had a lot of goal streaks kicked against them this year that's something they need to work out how to fix but a little bit more expanding on what Sherelle was saying. You say, oh, you know, we've got to nut it out out on the field. What are the sort of things that you can speak about to be able to change the trend of a game within a game without having that timeout situation of a, of a quarter break? Yeah, I guess, uh, Whitey, a lot of teams now, especially over pre-season, uh, do a lot of, I oh, can't even think of the word, but um, a lot of in-game training. Um, training. Match simulation. Yes, that's what I was looking for. Match simulation. <laughs> Couldn't even think what we were doing. We did it for six months, so I should remember. Long pre seasons, anyway. Uh, yeah, so we do a lot of match simulation. So um, by doing that, and especially for myself, over eight to ten years, you get to recognise um, what happens. And um, the more players and the more experience you get around you, the more 
uh, you recognise it, and the quicker you recognise it. So uh, I guess by doing these simulations all the time, that once you get in games, you hope it just feels like training and you can pretty much nut it out. And I think I was reading an article the other day that um, it's probably problem solving is not something that, say, recruiters and stuff normally look for, but... Um, when you think about it, when you're out on a professional sporting field, there's probably a lot of problem solving that needs to go on. So to you and to Half and to Sherelle as well about legacy of leadership, because obviously Hodge isn't there anymore, Mitchell's not there anymore, Lewis isn't more in the, there anymore. But is that something that they have sort of left you as the next leaders coming through, you're the vice captain of the football club, that you've sort of learnt from them and then it's your responsibility to impart that wisdom onto the next generation? Yeah, I guess uh, Hodgie, uh, Mitch, Louie, guys like that that were around were really good at uh, game situations and understanding the moment um, and certainly organising things out on the field. So, yeah, I guess you could say we they imparted a little bit of wisdom on us. <laughs> Do you, I mean, did you feel that, Sherelle, as someone, whether it be for the Vixens or for, for Australia, that you feel that that's your legacy is to... That, that wisdom that you've had is to pass on to the next generation? Yeah, without a doubt. And I, I feel very lucky with my career who I was captained by um, and the athletes that I had around me. And certainly they um, taught taught me a lot and taught taught us as uh, as a group a lot. And I think what you do as, as a leader after those ones move on is you take those lessons, you know what works and what doesn't, and but you shape it a little bit to, to fit your own style or to you know, what what's coming next. You don't do it in exactly the same way because that would never work. But certainly for me, um, having those great players around me was a was a really uh, a massive thing in, in my learning as a leader, that's for sure. And there's certainly been evidence that it has been passed on. And even that, that 20 minute mark or so, Isaac, on Sunday when you regathered the momentum, it would have been easy to say, bloody hell, be shell shocked and say, bloody hell, they've got us covered here. We need to just get a chance to breathe and reset. We've got to wait till a quarter time. But to be able to wrestle that back shows that what happened last year and the, the games that were put into some inexperienced players and having to live through those situations week in, week out, does them make mm. them better when they face them the next time? That was clearly evident on the, on the weekend, I reason. Yeah, I think it's really pleasing. Uh, last year was pretty much a write-off for us, but um, the positive to come out of it was there were so many guys that got games and... Uh, not even the guys that got games. There's a lot of guys on our list that didn't get games, but they see that there's an opportunity, and if they play well, they will get games. And uh, especially in the first little part of the season, we're seeing uh, Box Hill play, play really well, and we're seeing a lot of players uh, with a lot of excitement, and um, they can see a lot of opportunity in front of them. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that's nearly pushing the group at the moment. So it's pretty exciting. And speaking about Box Hill, on the weekend, um, a young man, well, not so young these days in footy terms, David Mirror made his debut for the Hawks. After, 10 years after he first nominated for the draft, he'd been overlooked for all those years. He was captain of Box Hill, was a terrific player in the VFL, and when he's 27, he gets his first crack at the AFL. What was that week like for him? How was he during the week? Yeah, well, he only found out, I think, a day or two before the game. Oh, so it? Yeah, so he didn't really get to enjoy the whole week. But I think that was a good thing for him half. He uh, He's obviously been waiting, I think, 10 years, 1,200 draft picks went before him uh, or something like that. So he'd been waiting a while and he said it has always been his dream to play an AFL game. So uh, I think that he only had probably 40 hours to think it through. Uh, was probably a positive thing, but it was a big, exciting time for the footy club. I know that there was a heap of family and friends there for him. There was a heap of Box Hill people there for him, um, and it was a massive day for Hawthorne as well. Even though um, he wasn't aligned, say, with the Hawthorne Football Club or involved, sorry, with the Hawthorne Football Club for 10 years, Box Hill was so aligned with Hawthorne, and um, he spent so many games around, uh, so many uh, hours around the club, but... The funny thing is they'd make a fair bit of a joke about him and he played in last year's intra-club and they did a uh, 50-game intra-club video for him. <laughs> he played in that many intra-clubs for the club but couldn't get a game and couldn't get on the list. So, uh, it did was he take that well? Is that he he, that took, it, sort of he <laughs> took it really well. Yeah. He thought it was hilarious. But, um, <laughs> Very funny. It was awesome to see him get his chance. and uh, I think even just drafting him has brought uh, Box Hill and Hawthorne together. It's amazing that... Um, you know, you can just pick a guy up that's been trying for 10 years, but the influence that he's having on the group.
Is it the same buzz? We often talk about the high draft picks and the young guns that come through and, and get their first game and, and told in the, about that in the week leading up. Is it the same buzz for the group or is it a different type of buzz knowing that a guy that's had to work his absolute backside off for 10 years and finally gets that chance? Yeah, it's you get a young guy come in and um, I think the excitement's around the potential of what he can do and, uh, you know, what his future is going to be like and he's you've seen his highlights tape from under 18s and mm. can he bring that to the afl world but then i guess with miz is that um we know exactly what he can do uh, he doesn't usually get beaten one-on-one -on -one and he always helps his teammates out so i guess he yeah, um, it was a different type of excitement um we we're all pretty excited because we've all known him for 10 years <laughs> um and just we know the hard work and um, the sacrifices he's made just so he could play one AFL game. So it was pretty exciting. Well, it was pretty cool. 16 past 7, we'll get to a break. Isaac Smith is with us from the Hawks in the Inner Sanctum. Exclusive access behind closed doors. The Breakfast Club's Inner Sanctum. 20 past 7 on The Breakfast Club on a Wednesday morning. Don't forget Mark Stevens not too far away with all the latest news in footy. After and, 8 o'clock, Scotty McLaughlin. <laughs> well, yes, a bit of nipple heat coming <laughs> from Steve as well. Scotty McLaughlin and Warren Joyce to join us after 8 as well before we hand over to Michael Felgate on Racing Pulse. But Isaac Smith is with us from the Hawks, the vice captain in the Inner Sanctum. And Isaac, some painful news that I read this morning, some painful news that Cyril and Poppy are out for six weeks. How are we going to fill this, man? <laughs> I think it'll be all right. I just uh, pumped up Box Hill. So, yeah, you did. Uh, we've yes. got a few players coming through. I think uh, James Cousins in really good form. Mitchell Lewis um, is in really good form. Brendan Whitecross has been in pretty good form. Will Langford, he came back in for one game, but he literally hadn't done a preseason. So, uh, I think he'll be building as well. So, I think there's a lot of guys that can come in and uh, play their role. Uh, and I think. Uh, there's some guys that we can probably shift around a little bit yeah. uh, if we want a bit more forward pressure. But it is disappointing to lose uh, Cyril and Poppy, but I think we're meant to get a couple of players back in the next couple of weeks as well, so that should be pleasing. I think the, the great frustration, obviously they're great players and they're premiership players, but they had been really good. And even for Piopolo's point of view, he is someone that seemed to have recaptured his best from three years ago over the first month of the season. Yeah, I think uh, last year helped a lot of guys freshen up. And uh, I know um, we went through a period of four grand finals in a row and that can be pretty draining. And you end up um, with a month less break each year than everyone else and uh, stuff like that. So I think um, last year, not that it was pleasing that it happened, but it was something that uh, I think a lot of guys have recaptured that motivation and desire. So um, it's pretty exciting times, I think. And with Cyril, have you been surprised at how good he's been through the first three or four games, considering he's had no preseason, pretty much? Yeah, well, I remember saying early on in the year that we wanted Cyril to have one of the all-time seasons because it mean we'd all come back at the end of January. <laughs> so <laughs> he's been playing really well. It's disappointing that he got injured. And it's uh, not really a conditioning injury. It was something that you can't really avoid. It was a contact injury and he's hurt his knee. So uh, I think... Um, Coming back January next year looks pretty promising. <laughs> <laughs> Still on the fly, yeah, nice work. Uh, so just the last one on that, you're a month in. Do you feel like this is a different year to last year? Do you feel like you're back in it like you had been for so much of your career that this is happening where we're right in amongst it? Yeah, it feels like we're playing footy that can challenge anyone at the moment. <laughs> last year I think we were one and four, so uh, it didn't really feel like we are in a uh, great position and – um, I think we'd had two losses in the first five or six rounds by 80 points or something. So, uh, 86. As, as you remember that, do you? 86. Huh? We're back to back, yeah. Back yeah. Back. <laughs> Geelong Gold Coast, it still hurts. Yeah, yeah. So, they're big losses. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, what was pleasing was on the weekend, you know, Melbourne get a run on kick four or five, but we stopped the rot uh, and then turned it around. And against Richmond as well, they sort of got out to a bit of a lead, but we pulled it back to two goals. So uh, I think they're the differences in our game that are really helping us at the moment, and that's the difference between being a competitive side and not. Tom Mitchell's been obviously in awesome form. Last week, it's fair to say, was a bit more closely checked and a bit quieter than what we've seen. Yeah. What, what impact does that have on you and the role that you play? 
Well, the impact is Sherlock can't get the ball when he's got a 50 <laughs> odd times. <laughs> but, uh, so, are you happy that he's reducing his. <laughs> oh, it doesn't touches. really worry me if we win. <laughs> Life's a lot easier when you're winning. But I think uh, it's awesome that Tommy's been in great form. But I think the most pleasing thing is that uh, Tommy was well checked on the weekend. But then you see Liam Shields and mm. Jago Mira step up. So, the guys inside, I think it makes it difficult for. I'm thinking a bit today, I think. <laughs> but it makes it difficult for opposition clubs. Uh, now, it's, you know, you go into the game on the weekend and is do we tag Tommy Mitchell or if we tag him, uh, Jager and Liam Shields going to get off the leash. So uh, I think, I think again, um, there's uh, a lot of questions now which are really good instead of Tommy just getting 54 and everyone else sort of floating around the 15 to 20 mark. Now, I was going to ask about Jager. He's come into this season, obviously, with that injury a little bit more in check and we're seeing the results of that, aren't we? Yeah, Jag's got uh, pretty much a full pre-season out, a full pre-season that he's has. Tommy and Jags hardly do a pre-season as well. Right. They just roll around and <laughs> do whatever they want. So it's no wonder they can compor- uh, perform in the winter. But uh, he, yeah, he had a really good preparation and I think we're just starting to see what he can do. I think uh, the sky's the limit for Jags. There's obviously a lot of potential there and, uh, he's, uh, you know, can just be a genuine star of the competition if he gets a really good run at it. So it's pretty exciting as well. There's been a lot of pressure on him and externally because of the price the club paid to get him to, to Hawthorne. And he hasn't had the run up until now to be able to be out there week in, week out. Have you noticed a change in his demeanour, like from this year to, to last year or the previous years? I think uh, it was probably more uh, blown up in the media and probably even the boys around him at the club thinking about, oh, he's probably under a heap of pressure. But I think Jags is such an impressive... Uh, individual that he didn't really show any of that uh, since he's been at the club. I'm sure he's had moments where he was sitting down and uh, he was doubting his injury or not. But uh, yeah, he he just doesn't show it. He's the nicest human. He's probably the best <laughs> best looking human I've ever seen. Um, he's probably cashed up now, uh, <laughs> and he plays really good footy. So he's got a few things going for him, and he doesn't show his stresses too much at all. So. Uh, he's a great teammate and he's someone awesome to have around the club. So are you rejuvenated? Talking, going back to that question Whitey asked before about the mental strain and, and pressure that comes with being so successful for so long. Uh, uh, do you feel different this year? Yeah, I feel uh, like I've got a heap more energy than last year, uh, especially two 86-point losses in a row <laughs> half. That sort of drained you a little bit. But, yeah, I certainly feel like I've got a lot more energy leading into this year than what I did last year. We spoke about some of the boys in the preseason that they do. You're obviously you have a running background. Do you like running in the pro season, or is that like is that natural for you and you enjoy it, or do you still hate it just as uh, much as I would? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't not. I don't not like it, Cheryl. Uh, I don't not like it. Okay. It's yeah. certainly a lot easier for me than a lot of the other guys. But uh, you know, there's a lot of running in pre season, but there's also a lot of physical contact as well. And mm. the guys that are weighing a hundred kilos. Uh, they're difficult to go against. So I say, you know, I get uh, my chocolates when I run and you get yours when we're wrestling. Cause <laughs> when I'm wrestling Hodgie or Ben McAvoy or something like that, it's awfully difficult for someone like myself. <laughs> That's a bad matchup. Either, yeah, either of those. That you got to find yeah, well, somebody else. And when it's in a phone box, it's pretty bad half. But <laughs> as soon as it breaks out about three metres, i got everything. <laughs> hey, we just had a text come through from a North Melbourne supporter. You're playing against two former Hawks this weekend in Jed Anderson and Billy Hartung. Um, Who played very well on the weekend. Yeah, they did both yeah, play they very both well. played very yeah. well. Do you keep an eye on on those two or others that have gone, obviously Hodgie's gone to Brisbane and Jordan's gone to Melbourne, but do you, do you keep an eye on them? Yeah, keep an eye on him. I guess I probably haven't kept an eye on Jed too much because he's hardly been out there the last... I think he's been gone for three years, but it's pretty exciting. And on the weekend, I was watching him and uh, just his physicality that he used to play with at Hawthorne. He looks like he's got that back. So I think he's over his shoulder injuries now. And uh, Billy at North's playing really well. Billy Hartung, he, uh is taking the game on and uh, he seems like he's slotted into their side pretty well. So, yeah, I do watch him uh, pretty closely. Whitey, and I guess you've probably got uh, mates that you're a bit closer to. Matt Suckling, someone at Western yeah, Bulldogs who I watch a fair bit, and Kyle Cheney's over at Adelaide, and I guess Hodgie uh, being up at Brisbane and, um, 
He turned a few kicks over on the weekend, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, that, that's uh, a big smile. That's oh, <laughs> oh, I was going to say, oh, I thought it was a bit harsh. A few blokes have been coming out knocking him. He's had a pretty good career for 15 or 16 years and done some pretty good things. So I reckon Hodgie might have 30 this week and bounce back and be pretty good. Um, just on North, they obviously had a massive win last weekend. Do you take much out of that? How much, Obviously, you do a lot of analysis coming into a game. Do you, Will you look at that game or will you probably kind of put that to the side? Uh, I think uh, our opposition guys will look at the trends that North have been doing over the last four or five weeks uh, and not get hung up on one game. But I do know just from watching the game that I think North are number one uh, defensively in the competition. They've had the least amount of points scored against them and um, they've probably got two of the best in form key forwards at the moment in Waite and Brown. So it's going to be a very difficult game and uh, I'm actually really looking forward to playing North. Um, they're always uh, good games and they're always, you know, fiery and uh, good fun and we're at Eddie Had, so it's a quick track so I get to run a bit hard. <laughs> yes, you do and we're looking forward to seeing it on Sunday, the early game at Eddie Head, sorry, 3.20 on Sunday uh, at Eddie Head Stadium. Just on the, the season that is at the moment, we're a month in, it's a bit of a sample size. We spoke to Maxie Gorn yesterday, I asked him who he thinks were the better teams or can you get a judge on who are the better teams? Have you identified any trends or understand the season yet or is it just too soon to tell? I think it's too soon to tell and it's funny this year it feels like and it's a bit like last year and probably the year before as well Western Bulldogs came from nowhere won it Richmond if you asked anyone at the start of the year last year they probably wouldn't have said Richmond were going to win it yep. uh, and it feels like if you're 5 or 10% off uh, what you can deliver on a consistent basis then you'll probably lose this year as well. So to get a read on who's um, number one or number two, uh, I couldn't really tell you. Right, no. You're the Hawks contenders? Very much so, Very much I so. would say. <laughs> Daniel? Good, Isaac. Daniel's son? Good, Isaac. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to seeing that continue Sunday for Hawks fans at 320 Eddie Head Stadium against the Kangaroos. Now, I've got one more question for him. Hartung versus Smith over 100, who wins? Uh, you'll have to wait and see on Sunday. <laughs> well, do you know? Is there any data from previous yeah, editions? I know who'd win. <laughs> <laughs> I'd wrestle him about five metres in And then I'd run off <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good to the first bounce on Sunday Get there and see it all unfold North Melbourne and Hawthorne this week Good on you Isaac, nice to see you buddy Thanks Al Have